Good morning. I'm hoping you're all hearing me and the technology is working. Um, I am Roger Geffen, uh, Policy Director at Cycling UK, and I am Chair, Co-Compare, and a speaker in this opening session of Cycle City Active City. Welcome to the event. And let me start by uh, thanking Landor for organising this event. There's been a huge amount of work to get the technology to work in the background, and I'm delighted to see so many people virtually here, whatever virtually here might mean. Um, you can see at the top there that uh, if you want to tweet anything about the event, there is a hashtag cycle uh, hashtag cycle active city 2021 um so let me just outline uh the the, the morning session um uh, the first speaker will be Rupert Furness. Um, he is uh, Deputy Director of Active and Accessible Travel at the Department of Transport, and he is going to give us an, a whistle-stop tour of what has been an incredibly eventful year and a bit in the history of uh, cycling walking uh, policy. And Rupert has been in the thick of it, and he will give us a Department of Transport's perspective. Um, I will then uh, I will then follow that with, um, well, well, qu questions and answers to Rupert. Then we're going to do a few polls to get you discussing, uh, discussing things, to get you involved in the conversation. I will do one test poll and then I will give the rest of my presentation and then do a few more polls. And they are there to help frame the latter part of this, com of the, of this session where we open it up into a bit of a discussion. Um, I will then invite uh, Becca Massey Chase from IPPR to give her presentation. Um, and then we will go back into the discussion, by which time we will have had a chance to read some of the comments you've made after the polls. That will hopefully become a little clearer when we actually start doing some polls. But before we get to that, let me start by introducing Rupert Furness from the Department of Transport um, to give us his whistle-stop tour of recent developments and what you can expect um, in, the forth in the forthcoming future. Over to Rupert. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, and a very good morning to uh, to all of you. Uh, I'm always rather worried when uh, I hear the phrase in the thick of it, because uh, life sometimes does feel like that uh, in the heart of the civil service, uh, albeit often with less swearing than uh, than in the uh, TV uh, programme. Uh, now, look, I'm going to try and share my screen um, if the technology uh, works. Um, so, uh, um, Hopefully uh, that has popped up onto the screens. Um, I've got a dozen or so slides and I'll speak for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, then, as Roger says, we'll, we'll have some questions. And I know that Roger will put uh, all the most difficult questions uh, to me because uh, Roger is like that. Uh, uh, so anyway, look, let me just give you my own personal reflections on what uh, it has been like uh, over the last year. Um, and if the technology works, I'll just try again to push get the next slides to come on. Uh, now that's interesting because my page down button doesn't uh, doesn't give me the next page. Let me just try one other thing. Um, that's interesting. Uh, I had thought that <laughs> I'm going to be stuck on the first slide. It's always it's such a good start, isn't it? Going so well. Um, I don't know whether Mark or one of our technical wizards can explain to me what I need to do to get. Oh, ah, it has come up. Ah, oh, sorry, uh, it's come up onto. I can see it on one screen. Let, I'll, let, so let me let me carry on. Hopefully, you can all see the slide. The slide describing the cycling and walking investment strategy. I mean, the, the point here was, of course, you know, interest in government in this agenda has not just started since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, the CWIS was a major step forward uh, following the legislation in the Infrastructure Act. Um, we had already some pretty ambitious aims, particularly the aims double cycling by 2025, lots of other good stuff. Um, but frankly, uh, and I'll come on to my next slide now, um, uh, the pandemic changed everything. Um, uh, it really, I, I like to think of it as kind of turbocharging what we were already trying to do. Um, and just looking back to what already feels like a long time ago, at the height of the first lockdown, um, Grant Shapps, our Secretary of State, stood up at uh, one of the daily press conferences, which we've all come to know and love. Uh, he announced this new um, emergency active travel fund. Um, uh, 225 million pounds going out to local authorities, um, the fix your bike repair scheme, 
uh, the all important new network management duty guidance to local authorities um, and a real emphasis on pace. Uh, and I'll come back to this because uh, uh, in many ways, one of the lessons learned was that uh, sometimes speed isn't everything, but the government very much encouraged local authorities, as many of you will, will know all too well, to quickly put in place uh, new infrastructure to enable social distancing, um, uh, to relieve the pressure on public transport as well. This was at a time when social distancing requirements, of course, meant that capacity on buses in particular was severely reduced. Um, that was May last year. Then um, we come on to, I hope if the slide moves, um, uh, um, some other reflections on things that happened. I mean, walking and cycling, of course, were uh, among the activities that were permitted during lockdown. Um, uh, bike shops were allowed to stay open as an essential uh, service. Um, sales of bicycles and cycling products generally um, had an incredible year um, uh, and figures from the Bicycle Association just con confirmed just to what extent uh, sales of bikes in particular were up, um, as was the amount of cycling. Um, the DFT's traffic estimates that came out a few months back suggest that there was 46% more uh, on road cycling in 2020 compared to the previous year. I mean, that was an extraordinary increase. Um, uh, again, the real uh, test will be uh, whether these increases were a flash in the pan uh, or whether we can lock in the, that, that behavior change. Um, as I've said here, a lot of the cycling and walking, of course, that we saw last year was perhaps for leisure rather than for utility journeys. Um, uh, and certainly, you know, anecdotally, if you like, you see an awful lot more uh, uh, as people using their bikes for kind of exercise at the uh, weekends in particular. Um, and, you know, our real challenge will be, will be to ensure that it's, you know, that, that we are also changing the way that we travel for our everyday journeys as well as our leisure journeys. Um, uh, and again, I'm just waiting for the slide to jump to the next one. There we are. Uh, so then we got to July uh, last year where we had the gear change document. And this, I think the fact that this uh, was signed by the prime minister, you know, real number 10 uh, commitment here, uh, this very bold new uh, vision uh, for a future where half of all journeys in towns and cities will be cycled or walked. Um, and it had a number of key themes. Um, uh, I think the, the, the key thing perhaps for me was just this indication of cycling and walking being at the heart of things uh, and, you know, certainly not seen as a kind of peripheral part of DFT or in the margins of DFT. Um, um, and I've certainly observed that change in my four years in this job. I think cycling and walking absolutely feel now that they're really at the um, at the center uh, of everything the department does. And of course, we had the very important, uh, you know, an un unprecedented amount of dedicated investment promised uh, over two billion pounds over the rest of the uh, parliament uh, to deliver some of the change that we want to see. Um, now, um, I mentioned uh, earlier this, that sometimes the rush for pace um, came at the expense of quality uh, and I think far too often in the past perhaps uh, we've had cycling infrastructure in particular which has left a lot to be desired um, uh, and my two pictures there are designed to illustrate um, the uh, the ugly and the good if you like um, I mean um, you know what we are trying to encourage very much is high quality uh, cycle infrastructure. Many of you will be familiar with um, uh, our new Bible on this, the uh, LTN 120 Cycle Infrastructure Design Guide. Um, uh, you know, in short, we want to see a, a lot more of the stuff in the lower picture uh, and a lot less of the stuff uh, in the top picture. And I think, uh, you know, there's a really important message here. I think this focus on quality uh, is going to underline everything um, that we do um, and I think we'd rather have you know less new infrastructure but 
meeting high quality standards than loads and loads of infrastructure which doesn't meet the quality standards. We will also critically, and I think this will be a game changer, have this all important new inspectorate, Active Travel England, uh, this new arm's length body, which will have uh, all sorts of responsibilities as set out in the slides there. Uh, we had hoped that we would by now have um, uh, launched the recruitment process for the uh, senior posts in the organisation and for the new uh, National Cycling and Walking Commissioner. That's taking a little longer than we would like uh, as a result of interesting discussions that are still going on in government about exactly what status the body should have should it be an executive agency rather like say the dvla one of dft's other executive agencies or should it be an office of the department which would be closer to dft and have less perhaps independence but would obviously also be cheaper and perhaps quicker to set up so you can imagine that there are some ongoing discussions on that uh, and until those have reached a conclusion we are unable to launch the uh, recruitment of uh, the new staff into the body. Um, I'm just waiting. Oh, there we are. The new, next slide. Of course, um, a lot of what I've discussed so far is the infrastructure. It's not just about infrastructure. It's also about changing hearts and minds, um, um, you know, behavior change activities. Um, uh, I'll just to pick up a couple of them, of course, uh, changes to the highway code. Uh, uh, we've recently announced that we will be um, um, going ahead with the changes to the highway code on which we consulted um, some time ago. Really important, I think, some of those changes in terms of making the roads safer and feel safer for uh, uh, cyclists and pedestrians. Um, getting more revenue funding out to local authorities. Um, uh, you know, we absolutely recognize that, uh, you know, we can't just have massive capital budgets, but they're not resource local authorities properly to uh, uh, to design and, uh, you know, deliver this new infrastructure as well as engage in the active travel um, agenda. Uh, lots of good stuff going on on uh, cycle training. Um, although it's been a challenging year there, of course, with the schools you know, closed for much of the last uh, year. Um, and we'll be saying more very shortly on the uh, national e-bike programme. Uh, now, as many of you will know, uh, it's not been plain sailing uh, for the last 18 months or so. And frankly, I've personally been very um, surprised, perhaps, and struck by the extent to which opposition to low traffic neighborhoods and other things has uh, uh you know has 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 you know, the, the extent to which that opposition has featured in the in the debate uh, you know you would think that uh these things would not be uh, uh in any way controversial since we are trying to create more livable neighborhoods we are trying to uh, uh you know stop rat running traffic coming down residential streets but uh, uh, you know, it has not always been easy. And I think there's lots of lessons here around the need to uh, consult and engage, but also a recognition that, uh, you know, we can't just have referenda on these things. You know, I think it needs it needs proper engagement with local communities to kind of sell the message clearly and sell the benefits. Um, uh, all of our own public opinion surveys as many of you will know show that generally there is a strong uh, majority in favor of these schemes even if there is a vocal minority which um, opposes them and it's not easy I mean we recognize it's, it isn't easy for local authorities to, to get this right it does need tough uh, political leadership and, and, and uh, you know strong and consistent messaging um, but that's certainly something which we perhaps we can reflect on in the in the question and answer discussion uh, just you know what we can do differently to kind of win the arguments on uh, this one. Um, I think a key thing was the document we published uh, last month, uh, uh, the kind of look back at everything that has been achieved over the last year or so, and a very strong reiteration of the government's support for this um, agenda, um, together with a few new announcements as well, particularly the fact that we are increasing the amount of funding available in this financial year from what the spending review uh, announced, um, uh, and lots of documents published uh, alongside it. But I think for me, the most important thing of all was just that this, this the government's signaling its ongoing strong support for uh, this 
uh, agenda and I think sending clear messages to um, local political leaders and others that uh, you know that we're not government is not wavering in its in its support for the active travel uh, agenda a um, uh, couple of things that are coming up uh, we're hoping to announce the capital funding allocations for authorities uh, in the autumn thank you to all of those authorities who've put in uh, excellent high quality bids uh, they are all being assessed as we speak uh, and we're hoping to make those announcements very shortly I've touched on Active Travel England and e-bikes. The spending review must get a mention here. That's absolutely critical. Of course, uh, my Treasury friends would say that uh, the fiscal climate is very challenging. It's going to be a really tough spending review. Uh, you know, obviously, we are determined to ensure that we get two billion pounds uh, uh, that's already been committed to and that we have a solid uh, foundation there um and also worth a quick mention for cop 26 in glasgow you know again the increasing profile of decarbonization in everything that the government uh, and the department uh does so this is my last slide um uh, uh and just to leave you with a few concluding thoughts um uh generally the profile of active travel has never been higher um uh, you know, and frankly, the case for it has never been stronger. You know, we link so well into so many agendas, whether that's the health agenda, the decarbonisation agenda, the air quality agenda, um, uh, cycling and walking ticks so many boxes. Um, uh, and as I've said there, you know, we've never had such ambitious aims or such a lot of dedicated funding. But uh, we're not there yet. Uh, I fear there'll be many more bumps in the road um, uh, uh, over the coming months and years. Uh, and, you know, we the spending review is not going to be easy uh, either for us uh, or for anybody else uh, in the department. So I will stop sharing the screen if I can work out how to do that. Uh, let's have a look. How do I stop sharing my screen uh, to hand back to Roger? Um, does that Good. has that worked? Oh, yes. Has that worked, Roger? Am I am I no longer I sharing? So. Yes. So I, as far as I can tell, you I, I have no idea whether I'm seeing the same as what uh, what what the audience is seeing. But your screen is no longer sharing, so I am assuming that this is all working and that I will get a message from the technical team in the background. If it's not, thank you, Rupert. I'm not quite sure how an audience applauds in these circumstances, but I'm very happy to say well done. Thank you. Um, good. Uh, and I'm, I have a little doubt that will be reflected by the audience. Uh, you know, I think you know Rupert, Rupert and his team have done a done a huge amount to to to, to take the um sees the opportunities created by you know the one the, you know one of the sort of silver linings of the horribleness of the pandemic was that it created some really quite extraordinary opportunities for active travel and i think rupert and his team have done a huge amount to seize those opportunities in in you know say acting at pace um sometimes with with difficulties and bumps in the road but uh, let me turn to the questions then so let's um there are a couple of come in first of all about uh, the highway code. One is um, one question is about just to seek clarification on whether um, it means that a, cycle, a, a cyclist riding on a separate cycle track parallel to the road will have right of way at junctions. I'm fairly sure the answer is yes, but I hope you can confirm. And the second one is um, how will the, all the new rules be communicated to the public? And I know that that is a question that uh, that I've been discussing with your colleagues in the in the team that are responsible for the highway code. Um, so shall I take that one first? I mean, you're Please absolutely right. There's, 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 there's no point, is there, changing the highway code unless we have a really strong kind of comms campaign, because many people never look at the highway code from one uh, year to the next. Uh, in fact, most of us probably study it in great detail when we take our driving tests. But uh, in my case, at least that was uh, 35 years or so ago. Um, so, yeah, we're very well aware that we need to communicate the changes. Um, my colleagues in the road safety team are working with our Think campaign people who, who have those quite hard hitting sort of TV adverts and other things. So they are they are planning uh, you know, a very active kind of comms strategy around the uh, changes. Um, as for the specific question about uh, priorities as a cyclist on a, uh, on a shared path is approaching a, a, a junction, I, I think Roger is right. I think the answer is yes. So the, if, if a car is turning in, turning left into a road, and a cyclist is approaching on along a shared path, my reading of it would be that that cyclist has priority over the over the in-turning car. Um, 
So uh, I, I think we can take it as a guess. Too. And I yeah. think from from a from the perspective of cycle planners and traffic engineers, actually that may turn out to be the most important one. I'll come back to it when I do, do my own presentation. But yes, uh, that's certainly my understanding. Um, there are a couple of questions about revenue funding. One about, um, let me just pick it out. Um, uh, you referred to more revenue funding for local authorities to build capacity and deliver behavior change programs. Is this just the funding for GP prescribing or is there further funding? And if I can just package up another question about revenue, which is, will revenue funding include maintenance money for existing and new cycle infrastructure? The risk of open ended maintenance costs is a real obstacle to getting new infrastructure in some local authorities. So two, two points on different aspects of revenue funding. So, uh, a couple of things on revenue funding. I mean, the the big thing is the capability fund, which um, uh, is uh, the successor to the access fund. The access fund went to only a small subset of authorities. Um, uh, the capability fund is a new <clears throat> thirty million pound funding pot, which is essentially going to pretty much all uh, local transport authorities. Although in some cases we are uh, we have not yet. Uh, confirmed the funding where we are seeking further assurances from authorities around their kind of commitment to the active travel agenda. So that's that big 30 million pound pot. Um, in addition to that, we will be providing additional revenue funding to authorities who wish to take part in the social prescribing uh, and indeed potentially the mini Holland uh, schemes. Um, we, we have received expressions of interest from authorities and we're whittling down the number of expressions of interest received to sort of um, determine which authorities get that additional uh, revenue uh, funding for those particular uh, projects. Um, now, maintenance is really important, uh, isn't it? Uh, and very well aware of, uh, you know, it's one thing to build a cycle lane and quite another thing to maintain it for the next uh, X number of years. I mean, generally across the piece, uh, my colleagues in the local infrastructure team, which is a kind of sister team to mine, are, um, are again putting in uh, an ambitious bid for the spending review in this area to ensure that there's adequate funding for local authorities for all forms of road and indeed pavement um, maintenance. Um, I should just say on that, by the way, one of our main aims for the spending review is to get a long term funding settlement for local authorities, you know, at least covering the next three years. Um, uh, you know, we're all well aware that the kind of short term stop start nature of funding is very unhelpful. So, uh, you know, one of our main goals for the spending review is to get a long term funding settlement, both on the capital and on the revenue side for authorities, you know, both for active travel and in the round for local transport, which hopefully will allow uh, you know, greater focus on things like maintenance as well as uh, as well as active travel. Anyway, I'll stop there. Great. I'm going to get to a couple more, um, and there are lots of questions coming in, and there's some real good ones that I'm not going to get to. I'm really sorry. I'll try and pick up some of them after my own presentation in, in, because there is that, that we're not going to get through all of them. Um, can you tell us more about the e-bike initiative? Yes, so we announced in Gear Change that there will be a national e-bike support program. Um, it's likely to comprise a number of separate elements, um, uh, and we're working on those proposals at the moment. Um, uh, these elements could include uh, opportunity to try schemes, so whether sort of short-term loans, if you like, or longer-term loans. Um, targeting e-bike support at those who need e-bikes to access education or work opportunities. Um, and perhaps the most difficult one uh, is the question of purchase incentives. Um, uh, uh, there are those in government who are really attracted to the idea of a um, universally available, uh, you know, money off an e-bike kind of scheme in the same way that we have for electric cars. Um, but equally, there are others in government who think that that would be a monumental waste of taxpayers' money uh, and would have huge deadweight costs uh, and would actually just be a nice uh, perk for uh, middle class people who could well afford the full price of an e-bike. So we are continuing to have interesting discussions about that element of the support program but yeah it's likely to comprise a number of those different elements um and we're hoping to be able to say more on it uh, later this year oh i should also say perhaps we're piloting elements of it in cornwall as well um that was announced at the g7 summit so we're quite well advanced with uh, sort of piloting some of those elements in cornwall uh, with the cornwall council and others okay uh 
last couple, um, they're both related to LTN 120 and making sure it's implied. One question is what, um, whether Active Travel England, will it review all schemes uh, funded or a sample to see how they measure up to LTN 120 guidance? And another question is, uh, um, I'm paraphrasing, whether it will, whether it'll apply to the 27 billion pound uh, roads fund. There have been other questions about the roads fund, yeah. whether it should all, whether some of the funding should be allocated, but I'll stick to the LTN 120 questions for the moment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're right, Active Travel England will become uh, the inspectorate which is responsible for ensuring compliance with LTN 120. I mean, frankly, I think it's likely to focus on bigger schemes rather than every single scheme across the uh, country. Um, but that will be one of its main responsibilities to ensure that uh, stuff is being delivered to the right standard. Um, it will be up to Active Tra Travel England, I guess, to de decide exactly which schemes to review. Um, on the question of Highways England, or should I say National Highways, uh, as many of you will have spotted, it's uh, had a rebrand and a name change, but um, yeah, it, really important that Highways England also follows the uh, sort of principles of and the kind of spirit of LTN 120. Um, and we're very keen to ensure that um, investment in the, or well, any investment in the strategic network sort of considers the needs of walkers and cyclists so that, you know, we shouldn't be building new road schemes or bypasses or whatever on the on the strategic road network without ensuring that uh, 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 you know a provision is made for cyclists and walkers unless there's an exceptional reason why that doesn't work such as for example on a motorway or something like that um, uh, so yet yeah, in print you know highways england should absolutely be complying with the principles of ltn uh, 120 um, and if any local authority is aware of uh, instances where that's not the case, I mean, I know I've been approached by a couple of local authorities saying that they're having difficult conversations with, the, if you like, the regional Highways England project teams, where there are examples where that isn't happening. I mean, do, do flag those with us and we can make sure that we follow those up with national highways. It's going to take a while to get used to saying national highways, isn't it? Um, but uh, I'll do my best. Good. Thank you, Rupert. Um... With that, um, I will uh, I'll, I'll resume sort of control. What I'm going to do before I go into my own presentation, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to invi invite you to do the first of a few polls. This is a bit of the, the first one is really just to kind of give you a chance to t check out the technology for for polls. Now I hope you can see if 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 it's not obvious where how to do a poll, does it pop up on on, on everybody's screens? I hope. If anybody, if it's not clear what you're doing, then please holler in the chat bar. Um, but hopefully you should be seeing a poll any moment, which basically is asking you where you are from organisationally. Are you from a local authority as a councillor, as an officer, from a national government body or uh, agency such as, Highway, uh, such as Highways England or uh, in, uh, National Highways as it's now known? Uh, are you a consultant? Are you a cycling or walking advocate? Has that poll appeared? I'm not quite sure whether or how I get. Um, uh -huh. I'm not sure whether the poll has. Yes, in polls. I'm OK. I need to. Right. OK. Fingers crossed you are all voting. Um, And I can now see the results. So the whole thing is working beautifully. And uh, so we have um, out of, I believe, around 300, 350 people are here, nearly 1%. So um, about three or four councillors, more than half of you, nearly uh, nearly 60% of your local authority officers, uh, a few from national government, 10% of, of those here are from consultancies, 5% from various private sector companies, and 15% are cycling walking advocates, 6% others. So a pretty good mix, but the, predom the predominant group is national uh, national uh, local authority officers. That is good, uh, in a way, because actually a lot of what I will be saying in a lot to the discussion I want to trigger will relate particularly to those of you in local authorities who are there, who, whose job it is to sort of make all of everything that Rupert's been talking about, making sure it gets delivered and delivered well on the ground. So um, can I ask the tech team to bring up my presentation? I was having tech problems, so I'm, I'm going to have to do the Chris Whitty thing of next slide, please. There you are. That's me. Um, so I'm going to do um, a sort of 
a bit of a perspective from uh, my perspective as a cycling walking advocate um, from Cycling UK. I work, we work closely with our partners in the Walking and Cycling Alliance, which also comprises um, British, British Cycling, the Bicycle Association, the Trade Body, Living Streets, the Pedestrian, the Pedestrian Group, Ramblers, the Recreational uh, Pedestrian Group, and Sustrans National uh, Cycling uh, Sustainable Transport Charity. And so we've been pushing for a lot of what Rupert has been doing. And I just wanted to, um, if we can go to the uh, next slide, um, I too will be recapping some of what Rupert's covered. So some of these things I will be able to skip through quickly, a bit of a preview of next, what next, but then some thoughts um, on how you can shape what comes next. And particularly what Rupert was saying about that challenging spending re review, uh, spending round that he, we, and I think you all have an interest in securing successful outcome from a from a spent from the spending review that enables Rupert and his team to then write a really strong second cycling walking infrastructure stra uh, investment strategy. Um, so I've got some thoughts on that, and then particularly what you can do to seize these opportunities, particularly that point about the highway code, what you can do to to make this stuff work on the ground. So on to the. Uh, into the detail, please. So um, Rupert's covered a lot of this, the the uh, the background, the cycling walking investment strategy, the legal background to it. The first first he was um, initially promising uh, 1.2 billion, um, of which only 314 was actually ring fenced funding. Uh, however, to give Rupert and his team their due, they actually did better than the 1.2 billion they originally said they were going to secure, by mainly by being, by being very tactical in securing additional non non ring fenced funding from other other ring, uh, other fen, uh, funding sources such as the Transforming Cities Fund, Future High Streets, Housing Infrastructure uh, Fund. Um, that's obviously it's great to have additional funding. No one's going to say no to that. Um, but it's less easy for you, the practitioners, to then have to fit the schemes to the criteria for each of those funds. And obviously there's uncertainty as to whether the funding is going to come or go next year, all those things. So I think we've you know, we've, we've all got an interest in, in boosting not only the amount of funding, but the proportion of it that we know is actually going to be there for cycling and walking. Um, initially, that funding um, was was concentrating in, in the eight cities, the cycle, uh, um, cycle city ambition cities. Um, initially, a lot of those of you who were working in Shire counties had zero ring fenced capital funding. Um, we're starting to move beyond that, and that is very promising. And I think this is what opens out, um, opens, opens up really, uh, really interesting opportunities for the future. The other thing, going back to 2016, 2017, is that at that time, the cycling infrastructure design guidance was really out of date. It had been around since 2008, and it had really been uh, out of date since about, well, 2008 and 2009, if not sooner. Um, so the fact that that has now been updated is very good news. Can we move on? Um, so um, as Rupert said, um, the the start of lockdown, well, just before the start of lockdown, uh, the Prime Minister announced five billion for bicycles and buses. Um, three months later, the Secretary of State announced that two billion of that would be for cycling and walking over five years. Um, and immediately, uh, uh, 250 million of that was allocated for that first financial year that's uh, that's now closed. Um, there were there were some other things that kind of got this 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 kickstart to getting the pop the pop up cycle lanes, the low traffic neighbourhoods, and so on implemented. With some net some new network du management duty guidance, which instructed local authorities as a legal duty to consider doing things like pop up cycle lanes, road closures, low traffic neighbourhoods, 20 MPH schemes, and so on. Um, so although some local authorities had been castigating this idea of pop up cycle lanes as ch childish antics, they then found out that they were legally obliged. To consider them. Um, it's worth putting two billion in context. Two billion over five years, it works out as about seven pounds ten per person annually. Or if it's not all going to, if it's if it, if if London is going to be funded separately, then that it goes up a bit. It goes up to eight pound forty forty eight. However, um, the government is has commissioned. We know that it's commissioned research that um, says that that says how much is actually needed to meet the targets it's set in CWIS 1 in the first cycling walking investment strategy to double cycling and to increase walking. And we understand that what it, what that research said 
is that the amount needed isn't two billion. It's more like six to eight billion. So in other words, we're, for all that, um, that two billion was six times more than the previous five year funding settlement. It was 80 times more than Cycling England. Rem those of you who remember Cycling England, the sort of precursor of, 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 of active travel England, when it was set up in, in 2005, its annual budget was five million. And we've now got 80 times more than that, but it's still only a quarter to a third of what is needed. So we had an awful long way to go back in 2005, and we still have a way to go, but we have made progress. Can I move on? Um, so, um, as Rupert said, last July, I would cite July the 28th as, sing as simply the single most important day there's been in the history of UK cycling policy. That was the day that the government unveiled uh, the gear change, and it genuinely was a very bold vision, as you know, it, it may lack detail of what funding is going to be allocated to what programmes, but the vision, you cannot fault it for, for, for boldness. Um, and as Rupert said, it was accompanied by new cycling infrastructure design guidance to make sure that whatever money is now spent well on high quality infrastructure, rather than the worse than useless the stuff that Rupert showed. And as Rupert mentioned, uh, the, 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 it looked, that was also the date on which consultation was launched on new high, high, uh, highway code. There are lots of proposed changes in that, and uh, it seems as if um, all of them look set to go through. I'm just going to pick out two really important ones, um, though there are many others. One is this idea of a hierarchy of road users. The current, the, the current highway code effectively says everybody is equally responsible for, for, for their own and everybody else's safety, regardless of whether they're a child or a lorry driver. The new highway code will say um, that although everybody is responsible for uh, their own and other people's safety, some are more responsible than others, depending on the, the amount of harm that they can do. And to a question that came up in the, ch in the chat function about, shouldn't we just go to presumed liability rules? Well, this gets us part of the way, and it'll be genuinely interesting to see whether this, how, how, how much of a difference this makes to, uh, to, to, to legal cases in particular cases, even though it doesn't actually change the default assumption to one of presumed liability, it may well make a difference in practice. We'll need to see whether, um, whether, whether the, what, you know, depending on how it works out in practice, whether, whether that does the job or whether more is needed to make sure uh, to, to really establish uh, the kind of changes to the presumed li the, the benefits of presumed liability rules that they have in, in other continental countries. Um, the, the, the other highway, highway code change that, as I mentioned, is probably the most relevant to those of you at local authority level, is this idea of, of changes to the rules on who has what priority at junctions and crossing points. So pedestrians get priority when they're waiting to cross, not just once they've stepped out into the road at a zebra or other crossing. And that's equally true at a side road crossing. And it's also true for cyclists, whether on the road or whether they're on an adjacent cycle track. And that, in turn, will make it much easier for for, for, lo for local authority planners and engineers to design cycle tracks with the kind of priority they have, whether at side roads, um, unsignalized side roads, signalized junctions, or even Dutch style roundabouts, those things will be, it'll be possible now to design those sort of things with the confidence that the law is going to back you up. A lot of local authorities have been very nervous about doing this up till now. You will now have that legal backing. And just to add to Rupert's colleagues' workload, that does mean that we really need a, a bit of a further update to, to the local transport note 120 to incorporate those those new designs, uh, those no, new uh, continental style design solutions. Um, once they start becoming much more normal. But um, you can now start, it will, it'll be possible to do those with much greater confidence once the highway code is adopted. We're expecting it to be tabled before Parliament late this year and become you know, effectively part of the legal framework sometime in the spring next year. Get ready to take advantage of it. Um, there are two different LTNs. There's, lo there's local, tra lo local transport nodes and there's low traffic neighbourhoods. So moving on to the autumn of last year, um, yes, as Rupert mentioned, there was a certain amount of backlash or bike clashes. It's regularly known against these things. But uh, Department of Transport's own research, uh, research from the, the Bike is Best campaign and our own research at Cycling UK, we found that consistently there's still very high public support, despite what some of the media would have you believe. Um, we've also found that the public support uh, cycle lanes, pop-up cycle lanes, low traffic neighbourhoods and so on, but they think that the, the rest of the public doesn't. They, they overestimate the public, the level of public opposition by about 50%. So the media is 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 convincing councillors uh, in particular that opposition is much higher than it really is. 
to my message is to though to particularly to councillors, but also to local authority officers who've got to support councillors, do not be fooled by those who would like to make out that there is huge public opposition. This happened with speed cameras as well 15 years ago when the same bits of the media started trying to convince everyone that there was massive outcry and massive hatred of 20 MPH limits and of speed cameras. It wasn't true. The polls showed it wasn't true and it's equally untrue for low traffic neighbourhoods. Hold your nerve. It will blow up. This, this will blow over the same way that the controversies over speed cameras blew over. Um, so, um, the government, to give them a credit, has been uh, sticking to the guns on saying to local authorities, if you're not sticking to the design guidance, if you're not sticking to that um, uh, uh, um, network management duty guidance, then funding can be withheld. And that's been very encouraging. Um, but it does create some dilemmas, which I've been talking to Rupert about, about whether there are well, uh, uh, whether there are legal powers that uh, that could enforce uh, that could be used to enforce those sort of agreements that when when local authorities um, say uh, say well all right okay we'll we'll do the right thing in future how do you make sure that they do it right well actually there are legal powers that the government could be using um, more recently this is bring us right up to date uh, gear change one years on um, it it commits to world class cycling walking networks by 2040. Does that mean we will have not just the quality but the extent of Dutch um, cycling and walking networks, particularly cycling networks? Because if so, that really does mean that the spending has got to go up above the sort of two billion or even the six to eight billion if we're going to reach that in time. Other things going beyond cycling and walking. There's been the transport decarbonisation plan, um, which came out uh, about a month ago. It's it's been much criticised. Well, it's been praised and criticised and sort of. You Know, equal measures. There's been uh, recognition that there are lots of really interesting good things in there, but the, a lack of overall direction um, and contradictory messages. The Secretary of State's own um, foreword um, says at one point, we must make public transport, cycling, walking the natural first choices for uh, all those who can take it. Many journeys are short and could be done differently and were done differently in the very recent past. Then elsewhere in the same forward, um, it's not about stopping people doing things, it's about doing the same things differently. Um, there's a comment about flying, and then it goes on and says, we will we will still drive on improved roads, but increasingly in zero emission cars. Will we be changing the, how we get around or won't we? It's really unclear. I hope that the positive bits of, of, of the transport decarbonisation plan will win out, but a clear signal that, that actually, in face with a climate crisis, we really do need much starker behaviour change, would have would have gone a very long way and uh moving on the planning the planning white paper that came out recently very disappointing in lack in the lack of what it says about transport decarbonization making sure that new developments are located as well as designed to be cycle friendly pedestrian friendly public transport friendly um we've got a lot to a lot of work to do with um to to influence ministers in the in the, in the ministry of housing and local government and that's a topic i want to come back to and and, and, and there will be others who will be talking about this later in the day as well can we move on so um, a bit of a comparison just in terms of where have we got to in, in, in England with where have, how has policy shaped up over the uh, in recent in, in the past year in Wales. Wales has, has set, I, I mentioned the traffic transport decarbonisation plan lacked a, a, a traffic reduction target. Wales has set a mode shift target to increase the proportion of trips made by walking, cycling, public transport from 30%, 32% at the moment to 45% by 2040. They put a moratorium on road building. They're committed to some kind of fair, equitable form of road pricing. They promised to make 20 mph the default speed limit for, for built up streets by 2023. They too have got some excellent cycling, walking, network planning and design guidance. They've also got some really good planning policies which we lack in England. And the level of spending, I mentioned that, um, so, uh, that the earmarked funding from, from central government is about £7.10 £7 per person. And yes, that gets topped up by what local authorities find from other, fu other funding sources. But in Wales, their funding is amounts to £23.80 per person. In Scotland, they too, they've now set a traffic reduction car target to reduce car use by 20% by 2030. They promised to set a, t a, a, a 20 mph limit by 2025, two years behind Wales, but it's it's uh, it, it's it's looking leaving England looking like the odd one out. They too have got excellent planning policies like Wales, again, leaving England the odd one out. And as a result of the uh, um, a coalition agreement, well, it's a, 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 an agreement, a, a government agreement in Scotland between the Green Party and the SNP, um, they've just announced that their current funding 
currently work, working, which currently works out at £21 per person annually, that it'll be going up to £58.50 per person annually by 2024-25. That amounts to 10% of all transport funding. And Cycling UK and many of our partners campaign for it and respect to the to the, to the political parties in, 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 in Scotland for making that commitment. Um, it does leave England with some catching up to do. Uh, no pressure, Rupert, um, for that spending review. So the spending review. Um, Cycling UK and our partners, I put our partners in brackets because I haven't got this signed off as this is a, a, sh a shared statement from our partners who I mentioned earlier, but I'm pretty, you know, the, 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 there aren't going to be many major differences between what we're all calling for. Um, we've we've said we we that 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 those targets in CWIS 2 to get to doubling of cycle use by 2025, that needs somewhere between six to eight billion. Eight billion would be better because it means the money can be not uh, can be spread further in terms of who it reaches, getting more to the, the more disadvantaged community the groups who don't currently walk and cycle. Um, it needs additional revenue funding to, to, to make cycling opportunities, walking opportunities available for the for the health patients, for the uh, uh, disadvantaged groups, for the people in the hellier areas, um, give them opportunities access to e-bikes and so on. Um, but of course, the health benefits and the climate benefits of, of that additional spending mean that actually it could be better value for money, um, despite being more expensive. It gets it gets you the, it gets you the same doubling of trips, but not not all trips, cycling trips are of equal value. If they're made by um, older people, uh, people with health conditions and so on, then they're obviously much more valuable. And if they're longer trips, they're much more valuable in terms of climate savings. Um, we want to see a kind of rough a, safety, um, a, a split of capital and revenue of somewhere around 70 to 80 to 2030. Um, it goes more like 80 to 20 as the amounts of money go up. Um, so I hope we're actually now in the ballpark where we're really looking for 20, 80 to 20 um, because the, the, the need to invest in, in the infrastructure is now increasingly important. Um, what's that money? What do we want that money to go towards? Well, first and foremost, to delivering sort of local cycling walking infrastructure plans. It's, it's first and foremost is the infrastructure, um, but there's also public realm improvements. Some of it needs to go to Highways England, to HS2, to overcome the historic problems of, of not designing road schemes. And even the earlier phases of HS2 were not designed to be cycle friendly, uh, pedestrian friendly in terms of being able to walk along or across the network. So there's going to need to be a, so a top up funding for the, for the early phases of HS2. Hopefully now that HS2 has also developed some better cycling design guidance, um, we won't have those problems with the later phases of the scheme. Um, we also need to start thinking more about cycling walking networks, extending them between the beyond the cities. As I mentioned earlier, it's been a very city centric thing so far. Um, but with e-bike funding coming along and with greater funding amounts coming through, um, it's much more uh, it, we've got to, it, this is an opportunity to say to the local, to councillors who thought cycling is really a thing for Greater Manchester and London, uh, no, think again. Uh, once once you get on an e-bike, you discover you can cycle further, you can deal with hillier journeys. It's much more, when we're really moving into the point where we can start thinking about what does the cycling and walking network look like around around a town that connects it to its surrounding uh, nearing nearby towns and villages and the barriers to getting people out of cars into towns where actually most people most of the cars in a, in a small town have come from outside that town what's stopping people from cycling isn't the road in isn't the streets in that town it's the 60 mph single carriageway roads around that town and that's what we now need to start thinking about as we as we spread as we spread out from the city centers into more rural and small town areas so the the the, the the 60 mph single carriageway road is going to become increasingly important some of that kind of funding needs to go to the national cycle network to various schemes to integrate improve the opportunities to to make those longer journeys by combining cycling walking uh, cycling or walking with public transport including bike share schemes and then there's the revenue funding as rupert said that's also really important it's not just a case of builders in there can we need to have the revenue funding uh cycle training not just for the children but for adults work play, uh, pro walking and cycling programs in schools community settings to really reach beyond the usual suspects who take who take up cycling walking opportunities to give them a try um you know try before you buy opportunities with e-bikes cargo bikes non-standard cycles for people with disabilities and so on and and boosting the viability of bike share schemes in more disadvantaged areas. So those are the sort of things we've got on our wish list for the spending review. Um, what can you do? Moving on to the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, what, what's next? Uh, Gina, I'm going to rattle through this slide because I'm getting behind. Um, 
the, the, the transport decarbonisation plan is one of the many things that's going to feed into a, a Treasury net zero review in the run up to COP26, then the spending review. How many years will it cover? We still don't know. Um, will it be a one year, another one year review or will it actually cover the multi year settlement that we've been waiting for for several years that really allows Rupert and his team to, to spend confidently for several years and to give you the certainty of what the local authorities, the certainty of funding that you need to plan confidently for really really comprehensive cycle and walking networks for your areas. Um, the spending review will be followed by a second, C, uh, second cycling walking investment strategy, and that's the thing that will really determine what, what funding you've got. Active Travel England, Rupert's talked about that, uh, and he's talked about the questions about how, how well funded will it be, what, what, how independent will it be, planning bill following on from that disappointing plan in white paper that too is expected late this year we're going to need to work on that and please local authorities get involved in this one too because we really need that planning bill to kind of enable you as local authorities not just to um, secure the funding for good cycling walking networks, but to resist developments that are in uncycle friendly, un, un, you know, that are unsustainable locations. Um, and so there's a lot of a lot of work needs doing on planning policy. Um, and then there's several road safety developments in the pipeline. Um, there's a um, the, the police bill before Parliament, the one that's created all the controversy about protest rights, it also has some very disappointing stuff about uh, walk, uh, um, road traffic offences and penalties. We need a much more extensive review of, of uh, what is careless and dangerous driving and a whole load of other things. There, the government is doing a roads policing review. That is an opportunity to obviously to strengthen up the enforcement of road traffic law. The highway code review, as people have mentioned in the chat, it needs to be communicated, but it's also an opportunity to, to, to review the design guidance to take advantage of the priority that, uh, that the highway, new highway code rules will, will give uh, to designers to give priority to pedestrians and cyclists at crossing points and junctions. There's a pavement parking review that too could, could create opportunities and a road safety statement that could wrap all of this stuff up. So several things in the pipeline that, that I, I hope as local authorities you will also join in in, in helping to shape. Um, so final one, final slide. Um, Please make your own submissions to the spending review. Make the case that you need the funding to develop those comprehensive networks and that you are capable of spending the money. That is a really important thing that, uh, that, that, that Rupert and his colleagues need the evidence that you have the plans, the, that the, the ambition, and some of our discussion is going to be about exactly that sort of stuff. Get ready to deliver in ambitious, uh, ambitious networks. Show that you can spend the money. Involve your local cycling walking advocates in helping you to plan those networks. Um, that they will do a lot of work for you if you get them on side and not a, not every local authority has a good relationship with their local authority with their local cycle and walking campaigners we're here to help broker those relationships we really want that to be a constructive relationships where where local cycling walking uh, advocates help you as local authorities to plan ambitious networks and to help you to to overcome the resistance that you sometimes face um, make sure those network plans are integrated into um, other other plans local transport plans which are going to be more important in the future those ha planned highway maintenance programs when you're resurfacing a road that's an opportunity to redesign it to be more pedestrian and cycle friendly uh, your rights of way improvement plans think about active um 15 minute neighborhoods this idea that everything should, every, all the main things you need to be able to do in your life should be within a 15 minute walk or bike ride there's some fantastic software that's um uh, uh, that link that allows you to see um which neighborhoods are already kind of how 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 well does your neighborhood fit that bill and robin lovelace who's be speaking later today is working on a tool that will enable local authorities to assess the cycle and pedestrian friendliness of a proposed development location um, it's still in development, but he will uh, do do pick his brains. He's speaking uh, well, firstly about the propensity to cycle tool, which you'll probably know is probably what you'll know him for, but also potentially about this act dev tool that he and his colleagues are working on. Um, key priorities for your funding junctions. Um, we, you know, we've had a lot of emphasis on the pop-up cycle lanes because of that need to work at, uh, work at pace that Rupert referred to. But actually, we now need to think about the junctions, um, particularly, as I said, making use of those highway code chains, crossing points, um, bus stop bypasses, bike hire schemes. Those are things that have not been on the funding agenda for people. Actually, they probably just need to go up a bit. And those behaviour change uh, programmes we talked about. Try before you buy, e-bikes, hire bikes, all of those things I mentioned earlier. Um, I think. That is that is it, isn't it? Thank you. Okay, I've overrun. Apologies. It's time I kind of 
triggered the the next poll and these are really just to kind of prompt discussion um at the end of this at the end of the session so firstly does your local authority area have um an elsewhere covering the whole of its area if you're urban or part or part of your area um and the same questions if you're rural or shire county or does it not have an elsewhere or are you not quite sure um please let's see your votes and if you're just think about your own area. If you if you're if you've got an LSWIP that's fairly well developed but not yet formally adopted, then treat that as you've got an LSWIP. Okay. And the votes are still coming in. So um Nobody has an LSWIP covering the whole of a Shire County area. That is disappointing. I hope that those of you from Shire County areas can get to work on rectifying that in the coming. Oh, someone does. Excellent. OK, um, three votes. Uh, three who do. Excellent. I'd love to know who who those authorities are. Um, better coverage in urban areas, either the whole or part of the urban area. Um, no LSWIP, uh, come on the local authorities who haven't got there yet. Um, Cycling, Cycling UK is working with Sustrans and Living Streets as part of a DFT funded project to support local authorities to develop and then enshrine your LSWIPs. Um, please take advantage of that programme if you're not already involved in it. Um, but uh, yes, OK, so let's move on. Next question. Right. Do you think your local authority is capable of current spending its current allocation? Could you spend 50 percent more? And over the next three years, don't think immediately, but over the next three years, could you spend double your current allocations? Are you currently struggling to spend your allocations or are you not quite sure? Let's see the votes, please. OK. Votes still coming in. We haven't got. I haven't got very mo many votes yet. Um, do I need to refresh this? So far, we've got a. F ah, right. Now I'm seeing now I'm seeing it now. I'm seeing it coming through. Good. That is really heartening that the biggest. The biggest vote is that you think you could spend double what you're currently currently getting. I hope to Rupert, if Rupert is still here, that that is very heartening news, that there is a level of ambition out there um, that local authorities could spend a lot more money. I hope you can take that back, Rupert, if you're still here, to your Treasury colleagues. Let's go to the next poll. Um, I was one. I, I put this question in just because I wondered whether, if 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 local authorities are are struggling, whether it's due to political will or capacity. Um, this is really just to test whether it is political will. Even if you're struggling for capacity, do you think you your councillors have the political will to spend doubling, uh, uh, at least doubling your funding or fifty percent more, or are you? Is, is, Sorry, can you just treat that third option as when I'm not not sure that there's really the political will in my in my in my authority? I should have said I should have said your answers are all anonymous. <laughs> I should have said that sooner. Um, let's see votes on poll four. Even so, with the votes so far, even clearer vote in favour of you could score more. You could. You could, you could, the, the political will is there, even if the capacity isn't there. Uh, the political will is there. If the funding came through, you'd probably grow the capacity. Um, last question. Has there been effective community input into your LSWIP? Um, let's just see votes on that one. So this is the most disappointing one on the vote so far. I may see more votes coming through. Um, there has been uh, limited or ineffective in engagement seems to be the one that's getting the most results with sort of about 40 percent of votes so far. Um, uh, more votes coming in. 
Yep, thirty-four percent have gone. For, okay, it's 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 evened up a bit. Thirty-four percent saying limited or ineffective engagement, whereas thirty percent saying effective engagement, um, and a few saying no engagement. Um, I had hoped we'd have a bit more time. I'm sorry, I've kind of my own presentation. That's my fault. Bad bad sharing myself. Um, I need to. Uh, let's go over to uh, Becky. Uh, Becca Massey Chase, and we'll just see if we can pick up a little bit of time, depending on how much, how how quickly Becky is able to go through her presentation. Um, so, um, Becca Becca is deputy head of IPPR's Environment and Justice Commission. She leads IPPR's work on transport decarbonisation and citizens' juries. She used to work at Sustrans as their uh, director of strategy and governance, but. Uh, I'll hand over to Becca to take us through what you found in your work on th on the environmental uh, environment and justice commission. With sorry sorry for leaving you less time than you'd bargain for. Brilliant, no worries at all, Roger. I would just share my screen and run through a few slides. Brilliant. Hopefully, everybody can see that. So, yes, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Roger, for that introduction and for such brilliant scene setting and analysis so far and really interesting poll results coming through there as well. I'm going to give a really brief presentation, don't worry, um, looking at this top line question of how do we prioritise the future funds we need. My answer is firstly, a prioritisation of fairness, increasing social and economic justice. And secondly, that tackling the climate and nature crises should be front and centre and that these two can and must go hand in hand. Transport spending must be directed towards reducing emissions and protecting nature. And it must do that in a way that also makes people's lives better, improves people's quality of life, their health, their well-being, and crucially, that tackles inequalities. And this is possible, but it is the opportunity that should be being seized right now. As I know you'll all know, the transport sector is currently the number one contributor to the UK's greenhouse gas emissions. So there is an imperative for urgent action. And this, this imperative creates a once in a generation opportunity to put in place a new approach to how we all travel. As Roger said, last month, the UK government published its decarbonising um, transport plan. Uh, and, and as he said, it contains many positive messages um, but publicly, it was badged as a strategy for decarbonisation that was about not stopping people doing things, about doing the same things differently, swapping one type of vehicle for another. Without a focus on fairness, and if we don't make the most of the energy behind the need for such urgent change, we could be sleepwalking into a future with more cars on the road sitting in traffic than we have now. As part of a recent IPPR report on decarbonising transport, we provide some analysis of the Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget. And the data that they shared shows how car use could increase over the coming years. So policies aimed at decarbonisation don't necessarily lead to a reduction in car use. In fact, the UK government currently forecasts up to a 51% increase in traffic in England and Wales by 2050 by which time there's expected to be up to 10 million more cars on the road, taking the total to over 40 million. Congestion will rise as a result of increased car use. In 2015, 7% of traffic was in congested conditions, and there's the potential for this to go up to 16% by 2050. So transport decarbonisation, non-negotiable. But there are choices in how we do it and what actions we prioritise and in what order we do those actions. And a path that focuses, and focuses primarily now, the energy of now, on electrification of the private car at the expense of other areas could lock in a more car dependent future and still fail to tackle the climate and nature crises because cars, even electric ones, produce emissions. We know that. And they're made from precious natural resources they cause congestion, they take up space, they create noise, they make our roads less safe and reduce social interaction. And a transport system with a car at the top isn't a fair one. If you're on a low income, but then you are less likely to own a car, but more likely to pay the price for others driving them. You're more likely to suffer from polluted air, from traffic accidents and community severance. 
I think really, really striking stat for me is that a child living in the poorest areas of Scotland is three times more likely to be injured by road traffic than one living in a rich area. And meanwhile, the average car in the UK is parked for 96% of the time. So we could be being a whole lot more efficient with our use of space and resources. So it seems that the UK government is currently, I think, torn between wanting to make bold statements on active travel and public transport and still wanting to reassure the public that they can carry on driving as they are now. I think they might have misjudged public opinion. There is a wealth of evidence that the public are ahead of policymakers. Citizens' juries carried out on behalf of the Environmental Justice Commission demonstrate the public demand for an alternative vision for how we get around. We spoke with communities in the South Wales Valleys and in Thurrock and Essex, and their views and recommendations point towards what ambitious, bold, and fair action to reduce emissions from transport could look like. At the heart of what they told us was a sort of core principles around putting well-being and fairness at the core of decision making. And that means supporting people to make choices that meet their needs, that the options for them need to be affordable. And we also heard a lot that they they want to stop damaging the natural world. Um, and that these findings are, yeah, you know, we know that from you know, other evidence that these findings are pretty consistent wherever you run citizens' juries and assemblies in the UK. People want a different approach to transport. They also think that fairness means people being supported. Um, it means people being supported and involved in making the changes. So the recommendations from our juries, just very briefly, they fall into sort of three broad themes, a shift away from cars and really crucially, really good alternatives, making it possible for people to access what they need locally and shifting priorities towards people and nature. So overall, they want to be more involved in the decisions that affect them. They don't want to feel like they're being, I think the word they used was punished for where they live or the options open to them. They want good choices. They want strong leadership from government and business and they want power to local communities. Our jurors hear from experts throughout the process that they go on with us. Um, but crucially, they're experts too. They are experts in where they live, what they think is fair, what makes a good quality of life. And it's that that shapes their recommendations and it should be shaping our priorities too. So what sorts of policies bring to life these ambitions? Firstly, we need a clear vision of where we're heading to a new vision for a transport system that people actually want. A transport system that I think connects people to the things that matter to them. And this means increasing walking and cycling and reducing the number of cars and our reliance on cars. So we need a target for reducing the size of the UK car fleet based on an understanding of the material cost of cars. Investment priorities need to change, as does how we assess and make decisions around that investment. At the moment, the primary tool used to assess transport projects prioritises economic considerations, such as journey times over emissions, efficiency over the environment. Decision-making frameworks are too focused on a certain type of person making a certain type of journey, not reflecting the breadth of people and experiences, doing a disservice to women, children, disabled people, elderly people. We should be prioritising Decarbonising public transport, putting public charging infrastructure in place, walking and cycling, increasing connectivity, especially in rural areas. As Roger said, at least an additional four billion should be spent on walking and cycling by 2025 to achieve the government's own stated targets for England. The Environmental Justice Commission is also calling for an upgraded local public transport system that's free at the point of use by 2030. There should be a review of RIS2 and we should be following Wales' lead in halting road building subject to review. Investment in roads is needed, making them safer for vulnerable road users, supporting electrification, but expansion isn't the right priority. Transport appraisal guidance should emphasise increasing equity, improving health and well-being, addressing the climate emergency and supporting a nature recovery. That's what we heard people want. Yes, there needs to be more funding at a local level. There also needs to be support for local authorities who are so often held back, not just by a lack of long-term funding, but also by a lack of consistent support and resources. Over 75% of English councils have now declared climate emergencies. Many local authorities have set net zero targets that are 
far more ambitious than those offered by central government, but in many cases they're hampered by a challenge of capacity and, and some skills gaps around things like how to leverage more funds locally. And I mean, as Roger said, that local authorities also need to be able to better block developments that will add to traffic. We need to change our approach to travel, and that means avoiding silo thinking. We need to think of transport as an issue of people reaching what they need and enjoying doing so. That means things like better transport services, improving digital connectivity, aligning the planning system behind these goals, those sorts of things. And meanwhile, many people here today have seen the difference that a good devolution deal can make on making progress on developing a local transport system that takes a region wide approach and reflects how people live and work and gives people a range of options beyond the car. And we need more power locally and more consistency in these deals. So to return then to how do we prioritise the future funds we need? Investment in tackling, trans in tackling transport that, sorry, investment in tackling transport's contribution to the climate crisis. That's money well spent. And the money and energy behind this can also make people's lives better. To achieve this, we need a new vision for travel, a greater shift away from the status quo, and a transport system that is fair to all, works to improve people's health and well-being, and provides a better environment for nature. And I will um, I will stop, I will stop sharing my screen now. Great. Thank you, Becca. That's excellent. Um, we have, we're sort of, as I say, my fault, we're kind of out of time, really, but for a couple of questions, we'll just eat a couple of minutes into, into, the, into the break time. Um, has anybody got a couple of questions while you're typing them? Um, let, uh, let's just pick off. I'm pretty sure the answer is that uh, the slides from all the presentations will be shared um, and that I, uh, that also you will be able to uh, watch the whole thing on catch up. If you want a second dose of it or go back to anything, the whole thing is going to be available online um, for, 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 for tomorrow. Let's go and see where um, We've, OK, so one question is coming straight away in areas with very high car ownership in my council area, it's over 80 percent. How do we solicit public support for change? People just can't imagine a future with reduced car use and are scared of it. Uh, are you scared of it? Certainly the experience that we had of working with the citizens juries is that people have got a significant appetite for change but they really want the good alternatives in place. So that th they'd be scared of it if they feel like the things that they can access, the things that are important to them are being taken away. But if the good alternatives are in place, and that's what people really want to see, they don't want to necessarily have the burden of car ownership. They want to be able to drive if and when they need it, but they also want to be able to take the bus. They want to be able to walk and cycle. They want those options to be pleasant. So. I think I mean, we went to, you know, went to the South Wales Valleys and, and Thurrock and Essex, two very, very different places, but both where people have, um, you know, many people with strong attachment to the cars that they drive, but they're attached to the things that, that the car brings them as much as they are to the, to the car. And, and we heard very much from those people that they, they wanted good alternatives. It'll be genuinely interesting to see how um, how both the Welsh and the Scottish government get fair electorally in four or five years time, um, having hopefully made progress on implementing their very bold plans. And I hope that uh, I hope that politically it works for them and that that will in turn embolden the uh, the, the UK government in, in, in Westminster. Um, any any last question for Becca or indeed um, just seeing whether there are anything that anything else that I can just pick up in the last moment. Um, no, not obviously. Um, yep. No. I th um, there. Let me just go back to some of the earlier questions in that case. Um, great investment. I know this was a question for Rupert, and I suspect Rupert's probably not here. Um, it, but I'm, I'll reframe it so that you can take it, Becca. I, the, the question was um, some great cycling investment, great for those that can afford a bike, but how do you make sure that funding is equitable for those living in poverty to be able to share the benefit from cycling? Any thoughts on what the funding priority should be based on the need to make sure that, that you know, there's equitable opportunities to take up cycling and indeed walking? 
I think it's a really good question. And certainly when through the work of the Environmental Justice Commission, we call for what we were calling a people's dividend from the transition to net zero. So saying that the energy and investment that goes behind tackling the climate and nature crises needs to lead to better quality of life for people. And in particular for people, it cannot disadvantage people who are currently living in poverty. It can't tip people into living in poverty. Um, and so I think a holistic, a holistic approach is really important. And, and I think what we heard from a lot of the people that we spoke with was that they wanted leadership from government. They wanted investment from government, but they also wanted businesses to lead the way on this kind of thing. So I mean, taking you know the example, um, not there of, of bikes, but of electric cars. Um, if you have a really big emphasis on businesses decarbonizing their fleets, you get a better second-hand market for um, for those sorts of bits of those sorts of vehicles. And I think there's sort of similar lessons to be learned in terms of that from from bikes. But absolutely, yes, there need to be affordable options for people. But you know, bikes need to be able to be afforded by many people. But, it, but it's a sort of the broad people need to have enough money to live well. It's not necessarily that the, the bike cost needs to change or the investment in the bike needs to change. It's that overall people need to be supported to live a good life without needing to own a car. Great. I am. Thank you. I'm going to just pick out one other little question just because it's it it, um, it could light a discussion that I hope will then car carry on into the day. Um, it was it was in response to Rupert when Rupert was saying we'd rather have high quality infrastructure than lots of poor infrastructure. How will this message be clearly defined to local council at all levels? Well, I suspect that Rupert will be would be saying if he if he was still here. Well, firstly, uh, it it already has been with the with the letters from uh, Transport Minister Chris Eden Harris saying if you don't stick to the local transport note one twenty, um, you risk having your funding withheld, and that's not just your active travel funding; um, it's potentially all of your transport funding. But I think there is a really interesting challenge for 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 all of us involved in whether you know. Uh, whether we work in the sector or whether we're advocates, on the balance between um, cycle infrastructure that is good enough and creates complete networks versus gold-plated infrastructure for a few links. Um, I think we can all agree that white paint on any fast or busy road is not good enough, and, and, and LTN 120 is, is absolutely clear about that. Um, but for an urban street, the pop-up uh, traffic wand is probably good enough and the money really needs to be spent on the junctions because those are the places where if you if you if you if you've got the links between the junctions in decent infrastructure protected but it doesn't have to be gold plated protected on urban street um, it's the junctions that are really going to need the serious cash spent on them and the crossing points it becomes a bit different when we start trying to deal with the eight, the 60 mph single carriageway um, but i will leave that little parting thought we've reached the break um, um, I hope that that's been a kind of created some uh, thoughts and um, thoughts and material for subsequent discussion, particularly around the issues of how to integrate planning into into uh, um, LSWIPS. I, I meant to do a little poll on on, on I, I had one poll which I failed to to ask people to respond to. Apologies for that. To find out how well you're doing in integrating planning into your uh, LSWIPS, I know that that's an important theme too. As I say, Robin Lovelace will be. Um, around to talk about that with the, the 